Hey guys, Capper here. Welcome back. Today I'm going to go over the top five mistakes you'd want to avoid when buying property. Now we have actually made some of these mistakes and we've also avoided a bunch. Uh, we've bought and sold property in I think six different states over the years. So we've seen a lot in the buying and selling process. So today I'm going to talk about the top five things to avoid and save yourself a lot of headache down the road when buying a piece of land. Now it doesn't matter if you're buying an acre, two acres, 20, 40, or 100 or more. The principles are all the same. So the first mistake is not getting a survey on the property. If you're buying a property and already has a survey, you're good to go. But a lot of properties, particularly in more rural areas, don't have surveys. They have what's called a meets and bounds description. And some of them are really rough. I'm not kidding you. In Kentucky, well, one of the several farms we've had down there, the description was literally like uh, from the rock on the ledge, you know, going in a northerly direction to the big elm tree. And I'm not kidding. That's, that's how some of the old descriptions are. We made this mistake before. We bought a, a flip farm in Missouri and we didn't get a survey. And then we had it surveyed because we subdivided it into two parcels. It was like 200 acres. And the house was actually, the living room was actually over the line on the neighbor's property. And once surveyors find something like this, they can't just stop the survey. Now they're obligated to bring this information forward. So uh, yeah, I'll do a video at some point on that, but surveying is hugely important. Uh, surveying also ties into another one of the mistakes. All right, the second one is confirming your legal access. Um, just because you buy a piece of ground that looks like it has road access, you need to confirm the access. A, a survey uh, can do this, because some properties, the way they're laid out, um, if you have a road and a chunk on each side of the road, sometimes them lines are off, so you don't actually have legal road access. A survey can determine that, and also when you buy property, some of them have easements. Like if you buy a back property that goes through someone else's property, you need to confirm that easement, that it's a real and legal easement. A lot of these properties people have been just using access forever and no one actually ever got and recorded a legal easement. And let me tell you, it, it can cause you nightmares and headaches and court battles if you don't confirm the legal access to that property. Which brings me to the third point is uh, knowing the building code of the area you're going in, whether it's a city, township, or whatever. Uh, here's an example. You, Depending on what you want to do, if you want to build a house or put a hunting camp on it, you need to know the building code. So I bought a lot in uh, Wisconsin and I wanted to build a house on. It was a five acre lot with a home on it and we bought the three and a half acres behind the home. And I bought a strip, uh, just a strip of land like 50 feet wide to build a driveway to this back lot. Uh, but I, I had done my homework, so the building code in that township was you needed to have 500 feet of road frontage to build a home, you know, because they're trying to curb urban sprawl, and it's getting more and more restrictive the more people we get spreading out. So anyways, legally I couldn't build a home on that. So I went to the town board and I requested a variance, um, which I got, you know, they were this was a long time ago. Uh, they may not give them anymore nowadays, but I requested a variance so that I only had the 80, 50 or 80 feet of road frontage so I could get a building permit, which we did and it worked out good. Uh, some counties and townships don't allow mobile homes. You know, if you're wanting to go in there and make a hunting camp and put a mobile home there, you, you might want to make sure you legally can. Um, we had another issue with that. Uh, Another nightmare. Well, someday I need to write a book of the nightmares we've had. But anyways, I'm off on a tangent. Know the building code of whatever piece of property is that you're going to buy, especially if you have any future plans of selling it um, or building or putting something on it. Even a lot of these townships have codes for sheds. You know, they got to be certain size. You know, they got to have concrete floors, things like that. So. Make sure you know what the code is in the county or township that you're buying the property in. 
All right, the next one is investigating the neighboring properties. It's kind of, this kind of can be a tricky one, um, but you need to know who's next to you, uh, how they're gonna use their property, how they are currently using their property. Sometimes you're gonna get burned on this no matter what. Um, but we had a parcel in Wisconsin that we lived on and rehabbed. It was 36 acres and our neighboring home was, uh, I think they had two acres maybe. So anyways, it was all good. It was at the end of a dead end. It was quiet and then their kids got big enough where they started riding dirt bikes. had to dirt bikes like right out our kitchen window because the house was kind of on the line and that's just one example um, trespassers um, boy I mean how do I describe this um, maybe unsavory people without the same ethics bordering you uh, one of the ways you could do this is before you make an offer on it, I mean, unless you're like rock solid, go out there several different times. Go out there during a weekday. Go out there on a weekend. I like to do a sound test, to go out to the place that I want to buy and just spend a little time there. Just listen. All right, here's a sound test. You know, is there an airport nearby? Is there train tracks nearby that you didn't uncover? Is uh, the neighbor got 15 ATVs that they're riding and you didn't know about? Investigate the neighbors. I I've often gone and just knocked on their door if it's a home or I would ask for the information and just talk to them. But you can get burned by that. I've got lots of stories of how we've been burned by neighbors. Matter of fact, every single property that we have thought we were gonna build on and retire on, it's always been neighbor issues um, that caused us to move on. And lastly, mineral rights. This is more in rural areas, but there's a lot of nuances with mineral rights. Down here in this area in Southern Illinois, um, companies have come like 20, 30 years ago and bought up all the mineral rights. I mean, so you have to find out A, do mineral rights transfer with the property? It's, it's a big deal, and I'll tell you why. Um, B, if there are mineral rights that are sold and they don't transfer with the property, what is it? Is it oil, is it gas, is it fluorospar? Is it something that's paying a monthly payment? They're all different. I've had, I've had to read several of them over the years. Um, one of the properties we looked at was actually paying $1,000 no, 1200 a year or a month. I don't remember. It was paying pretty good. It was a 40 acre parcel, uh, but it was a floral spar. And the wording of mineral rights is very important. Most of them have some safeguards, like they can't come within 500 feet of a home and, and they have to fix it if they mess up the land. The point is, is if you don't know what it is and you don't buy the mineral rights or they don't transfer, at any time down the road, a mining company could come and exercise those mineral rights. Yes, you would get some form of payment if they do strike oil or natural gas or fluorospar on your property, but your property's ruined. So that's the last mistake. There's a lot more, maybe I'll do another part, but best of luck if you are looking at property. And if you start with these five things, you'll be ahead of the game. So I hope to see you on another video. Thanks a lot and best wishes.